Welcome to this next webinar um, in the series uh, run by Taylor Wessing for IP seminars over the, over the summer. Uh, thank you for joining us. We're anticipating this will run for no more than uh, one hour. My name is Roland Mallinson and I head our UK trademark practice. I'm joined today by senior associate Simon Jupp, who works with me in the IPM media team in London. Our, our topic today is descriptive trademarks. Now, some might say there's no such thing. Uh, it can't be a trademark if it's descriptive. Uh, that's something we'll explore. I hope we won't freeze out on you. Uh, if that does happen, you may want to refresh the browser page or log out and back in again. Uh, in any event, this is being recorded and will be made available on our website later. Please note that you cannot be seen uh, or heard by us or others. Uh, but if you wish to submit written questions, please use the uh, Q&A box that you can see on the screen. If we have time, we'll try and deal with them at the end. If not, we'll follow up with you separately afterwards. Um, there's also some audience participation, so please be ready to click uh, with an opportunity to vote on something fairly shortly. Now, I'm pleased to say that we've got attendees from many countries uh, around the world, so thank you for joining us. Uh, and um, Sorry, uh, so um, uh, uh, this slide is now effectively broadcasting to the world and advertising um, uh, Taylor Wessing's uh, webinars far and wide. Now, I see that as a good thing, of course, um, but let's assume uh, I have a colleague who's questioning that. So my colleague raising this at the last minute. Um, this may be familiar to many of you, um, I suspect, in your in-house roles. Uh, firstly, I don't think the questioner really wants to know the answer. Uh, and secondly, the question's being asked far too late to actually change plans anyway. So uh, let's say they've got me a little bit worried now. Um, let's go back and look at that front slide again. I'm going to assume there's no problem with the Taylor Wessing name. I'm hoping we practice what we preach by having long since cleared and registered that. Um, so what else might be problematic here? Well, this is a genuine question I'm now putting to you. Um, I've identified five things that we must think about as being uh, potential uh, trademark risks. Uh, I've identified them there, A, B, C through to E. So we've got marketer's nirvana, lawyer's nightmare, summer, summer webinar series, uh, and my surname and Simon's surname. Now, here is my voting opportunity for you. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, please could you indicate to me what you would consider doing a, a trademark search on. Let's assume we've only got a budget to do one search. We're going to do it in class 41 for educational and training seminars. Um, so please could you choose one of these, only one, and submit it. And then we'll come and look at uh, the answers in a moment. Um, as you can see, two uh, at the top were in the main title. One was in the middle, more a descriptive element, possibly. And then our two names. So I'll give you a moment to get those in. And we're looking at some answers here. So everyone thinks marketing nirvana might be our most problem, our biggest problem. That's Simon, you've got zero there. You're, you're obviously clear, which is good. Now, was that um, really a, a waste of my money, my marketing budget? Uh, should I have bothered actually doing that sort of search? As a lover of the law, um, I can entirely understand why it is that the word Nirvana, or actually here in Cyrillic alphabet, is registered for legal services. What's uh, curious is it's not registered uh, for, well, maybe not so curious, it's not registered for legal services in relation to the word nightmare. But what is uh, registered is training. Uh, and uh, well, in, in France, you can see nightmare is registered for training. Interesting, I wonder why the French like that, but uh, registered uh, Nirvana for training in those countries listed there. So. Potentially, I have a problem there, but thankfully, I know some, some good lawyers in those countries. So if I do have a problem there, I, I will be in touch with you um, after this, this seminar. So those are the first two. Now, this one was an interesting one. The third one was the sub summer webinar series, if you recall. It might surprise you to know that there's a German trademark registered for the word webinar. It's a word mark. Covers presentation of companies arranging and conducting of seminars. And what's probably worth bearing in mind here is that it's uh, registered since, uh, since 2003. And under German law, 
by being more than 10 years old. That means you cannot attack that registration for being descriptive or non-distinctive. So you have to deal with it being a, a valid registration. The only way you can now attack it is to say it's become generic since then. And the burden, of course, is on a defendant or someone attacking it to prove that. Maybe I should feel reasonably safe on that front. Those could be famous lost words. Now, for those that voted uh, for my name or Simon's, in fact, apparently none for Simon, but anyway, I couldn't resist the temptation just to double check the position. And here we have a Chinese registration for Mallinson. I wasn't aware of this until just now. Uh, and amongst other things, it's registered for music synthesizers, which I thought was curious because actually there's quite a famous music synthesizer called Roland. So it did strike me as that I'm clearly well and truly shut out of um, launching my music synthesizer business in China under the name Roland Mallinson. Um, likewise, Simon, I'm sorry to say that you're also shut out of trading in China, uh, maybe in some sort of side business, in suspenders uh, for what, lardy, large, I'm not sure what the the word would be large sized uh, Chinese consumers. So um, clearly we should stick to the, the day job here. Just before we move off from this clearance process, um, there's another one that I thought it's worth, you're worth being aware of. Again, the word descriptive, I was rather amused by this, has actually been registered in the past. It's now no longer registered, it was la it lapsed, but it was in place for a number of years. Admittedly, it only covered software and design services. But what I would add there is had it covered um, educational or training services, I wouldn't necessarily dismiss it as un, uh, is irrelevant because it, it, you never know. The, the owner could still be using it and have acquired some sort of ongoing passing off right that, uh, that could pose as a risk. And obviously, this will, passing off will be discussed later on in this um, largely by Simon. So um, just what we looked at so far, we've been identifying marks with varying degrees of distinctiveness. This slide shows the different types of marks and where they sit on the spectrum of distinctiveness. And it also shows the types of industries that tend to uh, prefer or use more regularly the types of marks. So you'll see on the left, the distinctive marks often seen as very valuable marks, but the luxury goods industry and other industries uh, like uh, having distinctive marks. But there's quite a large um, sector of industry that really focuses on using uh, these suggestive or elusive marks. And indeed, they can be very high value as well. Um, uh, but they also give rise to some difficulties. Many of them actually uh, uh, and verge, if anything, slightly off to the right of the spectrum. Um, the owners might not think that, but that's certainly what third parties might, might think. But some good examples of those that sit in the middle with things like uh, Just Eat for takeaway food, golfing monthly for magazines, and there are any number of magazine titles that are quite descriptive, direct line for insurance, British Airways for airlines, uh, and so on. Again, very valuable marks, but somewhat suggestive or elusive. Some might say descriptive. Now, why is it that um, the marketers um, keep the, the likes of me and uh, others busy clearing and trying to protect these highly elusive and some would say descriptive marks? Uh, and I've listed some reasons that they, that they might like doing so. And at the end of the day, uh, in their view, it seems to accelerate the, the route to greater sales of, and, and profits. If they can monopolize this somewhat descriptive mark and shut out others, then that is to the benefit of them uh, and the business. Now, uh, those of you in-house might not be such fans of these types of marks. Uh, and indeed, many of you might be encouraging your marketing teams uh, not to use them so frequently. Uh, and some of the reasons I think uh, I don't really need to explain to you, but, but I set them out here uh, so that uh, uh, to be comprehensive. The position really being, it, it is clearly more complicated, slower and expensive to clear these um, descriptive marks, it's more complicated to register them, and it's more complicated to watch and enforce them. Um, so they're pretty unpopular, I think, for some in-house counsel. Uh, it tends to blow their budget. And, uh, and if the mark actually gets finally cancelled, it makes them look rather bad to their, their business colleagues. Um, in case that hasn't been enough to persuade the marketing people to rethink their choice of brands, I thought it might help to do a, a slightly more empirical analysis. Um, this table here seeks to put some cold, hard numbers into the equation. Uh, it looks at the overall cost of choosing a trademark uh, where it's descriptive as compared to a distinctive mark. 
Now, uh, I'm assuming a life cycle for this particular brand of about 10 years, um, maybe registration in 100 or so countries, and it would be cleared, protected, watched, and defended during that 10-year cycle. So you can see there, I put some numbers in, there's probabilities of things cropping up, uh, how many times they might happen. And at the end of the day, uh, where you end up is uh, a figure that says or suggests that descriptive brands are 10 times more expensive than distinctive ones. And the question I think that one could validly put to the marketing enthusiasts for descriptive marks is, do you really get 10 times more marketing sales and uh, uh, value from adopting a descriptive mark? Uh, and if not, perhaps you might like to think again. And um, to give you a flavor of how successful those traders have been in monopolizing these sorts of marks, uh, here are seven cases uh, with very brief summaries. Now, I'm not going to ask you to vote on these ones, uh, tempting as it might be, uh, because I think it would be rather meaningless. And the truth is that really so much of these cases turn on very specific facts, precisely what's being protected uh, and what else is out in the market. Uh, and so I'm not going to ask you to vote, as I say. Um, what I, before I show you the, the actual outcome as to whether or not they were upheld and enforced against others, just ask yourself, if, if your business colleagues came to you and said they were about to use a name, like those on the left here in the column, in relation to goods and services in that middle column, what would your reaction be? Would you think, oh, that looks fine, maybe we should just go ahead? Uh, do we really need to spend money on searches? Uh, and um, you might come to different views on that. But I thought then it might be instructive to see what the outcome in these cases were. So what you have here is some seemingly pretty descriptive and non-distinctive marks are actually being accepted and even upheld on challenge, you know, on appeals. Uh, it's quite interesting to see that the global steel wire uh, trademark registered in relation to metal wires, and this is a word mark, was Roland, sorry, we've 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 lost you on um, on on volume um, for about the last thirty seconds. Roland, can you hear me? Right, everyone. Um, I think we've lost Roland for the time being. So, um, what we'll do is um, it's not a bad place for me um, to, to, to take over. So, um, perhaps we can go to um, this later on. And um, what I'll do is um, start from where I was going to um, take over. Um, and um, yeah, hopefully we'll, we'll get Roland back towards the end. So, um, yeah, th thanks, Roland, for uh, that, that introduction. That's, that was all um, really interesting. So um, what I'll be doing is running us through some of the points uh, to consider from an enforcement and infringement perspective um, in the context of descriptive marks. Uh, so I'll be looking at some of the potential arguments that you can run if you have a registered trademark and the potential defenses if there is a prior, if there's a prima facie infringement, uh, we'll also be looking at some of the issues concerning passing off and descriptive marks. So you may be the owner of a descriptive brand, and you want to stop others from using it, uh, or you may have started using, or are about to start using a descriptive brand, and you're concerned about the infringement risks. Um,
So let's look at a few of those scenarios. The most recent case that touches on all of these aspects is the FreePrints case. Uh, and this is a, an interesting case in the context of descriptive trademarks, not just because Taylor Wessing was acting for the claimants, uh, but also because it started off as a passing off case, uh, which didn't ultimately succeed, and also involved later claims for trademark infringement. Uh, particularly unusual in this case is that the trademark infringement claim was partially successful, uh, but the passing off claim actually failed. Now, the judgment, uh, Daniel Alexander QC, who was, uh, he, he was sitting as the Deputy High Court judge, uh, his judgment touches on a lot of the historic cases involving descriptive trademarks. And so I'm going to run through a, a few of these and, and the key issues to consider. Uh, so let's look at the, the, the facts very briefly. Uh, the claim here was for trademark infringement and passing off and concerned both parties' use of marks for app-based photo printing. Uh, the claimants sought to protect the name and branding of their mobile app business, uh, which is branded free prints, one word. The app is a, a mobile phone uh, photo printing service, uh, and customers can place orders to have their have photos on their phone or, the, or their tablet printed for free uh, with only the cost of delivery to pay. So essentially, the service involved delivery of free prints. The defendants were using the name free prints, two words, for their app, um, which competed directly with the claimant's business. Uh, so the, the, the claimant was asserting rights over what was at least orally a descriptive brand. Um, but as is often the case, and, and I'm sure many of you will, will be aware, um, it was doing this for, for very good reasons. Uh, one thing to bear in mind is that the claimant created a market about five years earlier, and it became a very strong player in what was a niche market. Uh, by the end of 2019, free prints. Oh, sorry. I think I'm back. Uh, so, so by the end of 2019, um, Free prints branded apps had become had been downloaded over 17 million times within the UK, so a significant proportion of the UK population. Uh, it was a hard-earned brand, and a lot of money had gone into building it. Uh, and it was it, it was still a small player in the overall photo app market, but its position in that niche market was significant. Uh, the defendant was Photobox. Um, and it was the giant trying to get into the area. Um, it's operated in a different space to the claimant um, that had been losing ground uh, to the claimant for some time. And, and therefore, uh, naturally, it tried to get into the area. And ordinarily, this would be fine. Uh, but in this instance, the issue was that they used the same name and other elements of the claimant's brand and marketing materials. And so the claimant decided to take action. So you have a registered trademark that contains a descriptive element, um, and you want to bring an infringement claim against a third party. What are the claims that you can bring? A, a 10-1 identity, identity claim would be, uh, would be obvious if the defendant is using an identical mark um, as a brand for identical goods and services. Um, there would probably be a, a, a prima facie infringement, and the defendant is going to have to rely either on an invalidity counterclaim against the registry, uh, against the registered trademark, um, or else rely on an infringement defence. Uh, and, and we'll touch on that more um, later. Um, but for a 10-1 claim, that the claim would be run in much the same way, whether it involved a descriptive mark or not. So there's much, not much for us to consider there. Um, but now looking at a 10-2 claim, and I, I should just note actually for, for, for the purposes of any European attendees outside the UK, a 10-2 claim is the equivalent of a 9-2-B a claim under the EU trademark regulation. And similarly, a 10-3 claim, uh, which we'll discuss on the next slide, is the equivalent of a 9-2-C um, claim. 
So I'm not going to run into all of the essential principles that are relevant to a claim under Section 10.2. Uh, obviously, an important aspect is whether there is a likelihood of confusion. Um, and this is particularly significant in the context of descriptive trademarks. The case law that we'll consider does, um, it, it, it doesn't suggest that there are any general rules out to ha as to how to as, as to how descriptiveness should be taken into account in, in these types of claims. Uh, but it is clear that it should be taken into account. So if we look at the, uh, the, the Reed Executive case, um, in that case, the Court of Appeals said, where you have something largely descriptive, the average consumer will recognize it that that's a BSO, expect others to use similar descriptive marks, and thus be alert for detail which would differenti differentiate one provider from another. We can also refer to the um, Elliott and LRC products case where the appointed person, Daniel Alexander QC, uh, also the judge in the Free Prince case, uh, observed that consumers are less likely to think that two descriptive marks denote businesses that are connected with one another. And the reason for that is that there's an alternative explanation, uh, which is that the similarity of the marks is um, attributable um, only to their descriptiveness. The Nico Ventures Simon, holding. I, 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 Simon, Hello, if you're hearing me, I, I must say, I'm, uh, I, to me, slide 17 is still live, and you might be not moving it on, but that might be my mistake. I'm seeing slide 18. So as long as you're, as long as you're moving this, and at least people can hear me, which is also probably means I can come back in at the end. Sorry to have lost uh, sound earlier on, by the way. I'll hand you back. To not Simon. at all. Good, good, good to have you back, Roland. And. Um, <laughs> Hopefully everyone can can see slide 18. And, and apologies again for the uh, technical um, issues. Um, so back to the Nico Ventures um, London Vape Company case. Um, in this case, uh, this concerned the registration of a figurative mark incorporating Vape and Co for e-cigarettes. It was opposed by the proprietor of a prior registration for a figurative mark, including the words. Um, the Vape Co. Uh, now, Justice Birch held in this case that where common elements are descriptive and non-distinctive, it is necessary to focus on the impact of this on the likelihood of confusion. Uh, whilst it does not preclude, preclude a likelihood of confusion, it does weigh against it. Uh, so, so what these cases are showing is that there is no hard rule that use of a descriptive term cannot lead to a finding that there is confusion. Um, but they also show that a case is harder to establish. Uh, and this is something to bear in mind and goes back to, uh, goes to Roland, Roland's point earlier about the additional expense of descriptive marks. Right. Um, so a 10.3 claim under the Trademarks Act. Under Section 10.3, a registered trademark owner has the right to prevent unauthorized third parties from using an identical or similar sign to the registered mark where the trademark has a reputation in the UK and where the use of the sign is without due cause and takes unfair advantage of or is detrimental to the distinctive character or repute of the trademark. So let's look at some of these elements in turn um, in the context, um, again, um, of descriptive marks. So is there a link? Infringement under this provision requires a degree of similarity between the registered mark and the infringing sign, uh, such that the average consumer makes a connection between them. So it's not necessary for there to be um, a likelihood of confusion, but the average consumer must establish a link between the mark and the allegedly inf uh, infringing sign. Uh, so as the owner of a descriptive mark, you might struggle to establish um, that there is this calling to mind in, in, in the first place um, because, it's a, uh, because it's a descriptive mark, um, and especially if the use is arguably not used as a brand. Um, is there detriment to the distinctive character of the mark, um, otherwise known as dilution? Uh, detriment is caused when that mark's ability to identify goods and services for which it is registered as coming from the proprietor of that mark is weakened. Um, 
So the general court in, in the Sigler Ohim case uh, said that the risk of dilution will be lower if the earlier mark consists of an inherently descriptive term. Um, so in other words, you're less likely to have the right to complain that your brand is being diluted if you have chosen a mark which is of limited distinctiveness in the first place. So you can see a kind of trend um, happening here of, 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 of not, not insurmountable obstacles, but, but certainly difficulties um, with, with, with running these cases where, where you have a descriptive mark. Uh, unfair advantage, does use of the descriptive mark take unfair advantage? Well, let's consider what, what prestige and power of attraction does a descriptive mark actually have? Uh, in some cases, it won't have any, being a descriptive mark. Um, but it's, of course, there are also many examples of famous descriptive brands which do have significant prestige and power. Uh, even if the claimant was able to establish a relevant advantage, is use of a descriptive phrase to communicate the nature of the service offered unfair? In the case of uh, L'Oreal and Belleur, the, the 2009 case, uh, the CJEU said that the more immediately and strongly the registered mark is brought to mind by the infringing sign, the greater the likelihood that current or future use of the infringing sign is taking or will take unfair advantage. And finally, uh, is, is the use of the sign uh, without due cause. And remember here that the burden is on the defendant um, to, to show that there is due cause. Uh, so where the registered mark includes descriptive elements and the 10-3 claim is largely based on the common use of those elements, it will usually be easier for the defendant to show that uh, use of those elements is with due cause. And, and that was the view of Daniel Alexander QC uh, when he sat as the Deputy High Court judge in the Free Prince case. So moving on to the next slide, and hopefully everyone can see a slide with uh, five logos on it titled Trademark Infringement. Um, hopefully Roland can too. Uh, so, so here, let's, uh, how, did, how did trademark infringement uh, play out in the free prints case, bearing in mind everything that we've just discussed? Uh, well, on the left, you have the claimant's registration, which was for the free prints logo, together with the, um, with the, words, with, with the one word, free prints. This is the app icon that users see day-to-day uh, -day on their screen when they've downloaded the app. Uh, the trademark uh, claim focused on the four logos uh, to the right of the screen. Um, and in this case, the word mark wasn't subject to the trademark infringement claim, but it was for the uh, passing off claim, and we'll consider that later. Uh, so as you'll see on the screen, the free print trademark claim was partially successful. Um, the left two logos with the ticks under them, um, those were the logos used for Photobox's mobile printing app. Um, and the judge found that this did amount to trademark use and was not purely descriptive use. He held that um, these logos infringed the claimant's trademark under both section 10.2 and 10.3. Uh, there were similarities in the oral and visual elements of the sign and some conceptual uh, similarities, although to a lesser degree. Uh, so the photo box icon was a similar turquoise color to Planet Arts, and it also featured a simple white line drawing. And beneath the icon were the words uh, free prints. Uh, and whilst the, the judge did express some sympathy that there is a limit on the number of characters which an app developer can use, beneath the icon, he, he did also note in, in question that it, was, it, it wasn't clear from the evidence why the full name photo box free prints uh, was not used, um, since this was within the 30 character limit set by the Apple App Store. Um, in relation to the two other uh, logos, the, the judge reached a different conclusion. Um, and the main reason for this was that the marks did um, did not contain the word photo box, um, and they didn't contain it um, in a way that was prominent and in a position and manner where ordinarily consumers would expect a brand to be found. Um, so effectively the, the combined, effectively, the combined brand here was acceptable 
use. Defending your use of a descriptive mark against a registered trademark infringement claim. Uh, so, so far, we've considered whether there is a prima facie case. Um, now let's touch on um, the possible defenses and counterclaims. Uh, the first is a counterclaim for invalidity. So is the earlier registration valid in the first place? And to some extent, Roland's already touched on a lot of the relevant issues here, and in particular, whether the marks conflict with someone else's earlier right and whether the mark is inherently registrable. Uh, in both cases, it might be possible to knock out the registration, and, and if so, uh, the claimant, uh, sorry, if, if so, the, the claim will, will fall away. Um, so that's the first um, option to, to consider by way of. Uh, it's not so much a defense, but it's a, it's a, it's a counterclaim. Um, in terms of the actual defenses, um, so these only become relevant if the elements of infringement are actually established in the first place. So uh, non-trademark use, uh, a possible defense to trademark infringement is that the um, allegedly infringing sign is not actually being used as a, as a trademark. Uh, for example, it could be used um, in a purely descriptive manner. Uh, for that to occur, it, it, it must be used in a way that is not liable to affect any of the functions of a trademark, um, such functions being um, to indicate origin or to guarantee the, the quality of goods and services. Um, technically, this is not a defense as such, since um, if that hurdle um, isn't passed, then there's actually no prima facie infringement in the first place. Um, so now looking at um, a section 11.2b defense, um, known um, often known as the, the honest descriptive use defense. Um, so this is under section 11.2b of the, of the Trademarks Act. Uh, and there are two limbs to this defense. First, the court must determine whether the sign complained of is non-distinctive or descriptive of the characteristics of goods and services. Uh, second, the court must consider whether the use complained of is in accordance with honest practices of industrial or commercial matters. Uh, and this is a, an objective assessment. And um, all of the legal principles governing um, that assessment um, were, were summarized in 2012 by um, Justice Arnold, as he then was in the Samuel Smith Old Brewery case. Um, but, but that's not something we're going to go into um, today. Uh, there's also a further defense under Section 112C of the Trademarks Act. Um, this wasn't a defense that was relevant for the Free Prince case. And I suppose it's got a, a fairly um, narrow um, use. Uh, so it's, it's, um, it's where the use is, is necessary to indicate the intended purpose of goods and services. Uh, this, this defense is often relied on in, in cases where the defendant is reselling or repairing the claimant's goods, such as, um, such as car dealers. Uh, and it also applies where the use is shown, uh, the use is to show compatibil compatibility with the branded goods, um, such as for replacement parts. Uh, so what was the position in free prints? Uh, did they rely on any of these defenses? Uh, well, at the start of the trial, the defendant, Photobox, made an application to re-amend their pleadings um, to plead a Section 112B defence. Uh, it's, it's not clear why the defence was uh, not raised earlier by the defendants, um, but it was allowed. Um, they alleged that the sign free prints was not distinctive, um, but it was descriptive of its goods and services, and that um, their use of free prints, two words, was in accordance with um, honest commercial practices. So the judge did give late permission for the defense to be amended, primarily on the basis that um, his view was that it would not actually make any difference. Uh, and the reason for that was um, insofar as the sign alleged benefit from that defense is free prints, two words, um, if it's combined with the term photo box, in a um, in a prominent way, then there would be no infringement, as as had already been um, decided. So far as it's not, 
such as in the um, photo box app icon, it's not merely descriptive and the use would not be in accordance with honest, practice, honest practices. And so the, the, this view was, um, it, it echoes similar comments made by Douglas Campbell QC when he was sitting as a high court judge in the 2017, 2017 fun time case. Uh, he was also a barrister in the free print case. Um, and, it, and in his judgment, Douglas Campbell said that um, although the defendant originally pleaded a, a defense under section 11 2b, uh, this was not pursued in oral argument. And the defendant took the view and in his judgment correctly, that if it did not win a section 10 claim, then given the circumstances of the claim, it was unlikely to win under section 11. So the point here is that in reality, a section 11 2b defense in a descriptiveness case becomes a bit of an afterthought because all of the issues are, consider, are considered um, earlier at the infringement stage. So let's look at passing off now. As um, most attendees will know, liability for passing off depends on the three elements of goodwill, a material misrepresentation, and consequential damage to goodwill. And when descriptive terms are in play, it's particularly important to look at the case law um, from which it is clear that in order to pursue a claim for passing off in relation to a purely descriptive mark, such as free prints, two words, um, then that mark must have acquired secondary meaning. And what I mean by secondary meaning is um, that the descriptive phrase has lost its primary descriptive meaning and instead has come to mean the goods and services of a single trader. Uh, all of the cases that I'm going to discuss here were considered in some depth by the judge in the free prints case. Um, so let's start off with the, um, with the camel hair belting case. Um, it's a very old case dating back to 1896, um, but it's still a leading, a leading case and the focus of particular debate in the free prints case. Uh, the claimants here made and sold woolen belting under the name camel hair belting. Um, the belting was, in fact, largely made of camel hair, although that was not widely known. And, that, and that's, that's an important factor because to a member of the general public who didn't know that the belting was actually made from camel hair, uh, the term camel hair belting wouldn't have had a descriptive significance. Um, another point to note is that a lot of manufacturers, um, manufacturers in those days had for many years sold um, belting, which was actually made of camel hair, and, but, but it was sold and described under other names such as yak, buffalo, llama, crocodile, and, 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 and other animals. Uh, the defendant started selling his belting as Arabian belting, but then changed the name to camel hair belting. Um, and the defendant argued in response to the claim that camel hair belting was uh, descriptive of the goods and therefore it had a good, a good defense to the action. Uh, the House of Lords actually sided with the claimant. Um, this was mainly because of key evidence from one of the defendant's customers who had specifically asked that the belting should bear no other stamp than camel belting. And if he got that, he thought that he could take the order from Redaways. Um, so what that evidence demonstrates is that camel hair belting referred to the product as manufactured by the claimant. So although that mark was descriptive, it had actually acquired a secondary meaning. Um, sort of, it, in other words, it, it had become come to be associated with the, with the claimant's business. Now this case this case reflected a central issue in these in these sorts of passing off cases, in that it's not as much what is not said by defendant as what is said. Um, so if a defendant omits use of its own brand in circumstances where a distinctive, a descriptive term has become distinctive of a claimant, so secondary meaning, uh, members of the public are more likely to treat the term as distinctive of the claimant in sufficient numbers for it to amount to passing off. I'll now very briefly touch um, touch on some of the later case law. Um, so the first case being um, office, the office cleaning services 
um, case. Um, in this case, it was held that office cleaning association was sufficiently different to office cleaning services in relation to office cleaning services. Uh, and in this case, Lord Simmons commented that where a trader adopts descriptive words, some risk of confusion is inevitable and the threshold for actionable misrepresentation will be higher. Um, so the court um, will accept comparatively small differences as sufficient to avoid confusion. In the uh, Cranford Community College case, a community college in Cranford uh, sued to stop another college in Cranford calling itself Cranford College. Uh, and the claimant relied largely on goodwill in, um, in, the, in the name Cranford College. Um, but one of the issues was that it had only used that name rarely rather than Cranford Community College, which was its primary name. Uh, and this claim was dismissed. The judge held that the name Cranford College was prima facie descriptive of a college located in Cranford. Um, and the claimant therefore had to show that it acquired a secondary meaning, um, which it failed to do. Um, and consequently, it failed to show that it had requisite goodwill. Um, and in this case, there was also inf insufficient evidence of any misrepresentation. Let's look at the, the third case, uh, the media agency case. Um, in this case, the Court of Appeal upheld a finding of passing off. Um, so the, the claimant had attracted um, what was significant business through the website Transport Media, uh, transportmedia.co.uk, I think, uh, which amounted to clear evidence of goodwill and the defendant's activities had caused damaging confusion. Uh, and, and, the, and the court found that the name in this case was, was found to have only descriptive elements as opposed to being purely descriptive. Um, but Lord Justice Floyd did say that it was trite law that a descriptive name or mark can support an action for passing off if it has acquired distinctiveness through use. Uh, finally, uh, in the Hasbro uh, Play-Doh case, um, so in this case, by promoting their powdered edible dough mix as the edible Play-Doh, uh, the defendants um, infringed the claimant's Play-Doh trademark and passed off their goods as the claimant's product. Um, the defendants did try to argue that Play-Doh, um, as they used it, was entirely descriptive and that the claimants um, could not rely on its Play-Doh, D-O-H, mark, uh, to stop the use of the strap line. Um, and Justice Floyd, as, as he then was, rejected his uh, this defense and found for the um, claimant on both trademark infringement and passing off. So what was the position um, with passing off in the free prints case? Um, so goodwill here was asserted in free prints, one word, not the two separate words. Um, and the deputy judge, Daniel Alexander QC, noted that uh, there was some goodwill to be found in elements of the mark, um, so in three prints, one word, and the visual elements of the three prints icon, such as the butterfly design and its coloring, um, but not in others, um, such as the color turquoise. Uh, so when examining whether there had been misrepresentation uh, Daniel Alexander noted that uh, the importance of the broader context of use of the mark um, in, the, in the passing off claim and, and how there was significant use of photo box branding and, and that that use of, of the photo box uh, branding would dispel any actual confusion. And um, it was this combined with an important lack of evidence of actual confusion um, that meant that there was no misrepresentation. And this in turn meant that there was no damage and, and no passing off. I think a, a, an important distinction between the trademark infringement claim and the passing off claim is that the likelihood of confusion in a trademark case focuses on the reaction of a notional average consumer. Um, so that's the trademark case. But in passing off, the evidence or absence of actual confusion is more important. It's um, it's not, it's not the end of the road if you don't have actual, inf in, uh, confu uh, uh, actual confusion in a passing off case, but it's, um, it's certainly going to be more um, important and, and could be decisive. Uh, and, and finally, before I 
Parsons Rowland. Um, I did include that quote at the um, bottom from Daniel, Daniel Alexander in the um, judgment, um, mainly because I was amused um, when I was making these slides um, by the topical reference to antisocial non-distancing of the defendants. Um, and this is actually a reference to the elements of the claimant's marketing materials that the defendants have borrowed rather um, blatantly. Um, but bearing in mind the judgment was handed down two days after the lockdown was was announced in the UK at the, at the end of March, um, perhaps um, the, the deputy judge had recent events at the back of his mind when he uh, when he made this this comment. So now, with, without further ado, hopefully I'm going to pass back to to Roland. Um, and Roland, I don't know whether you want to continue from from where or whether you want to go back. Um, in the slides, but no, I'll, I'll leave that I, for you. I'm perfectly happy, and I'm hoping people can hear me now. Uh, I do apologise for being cut off earlier on. Uh, and uh, for those who ever suffer this again, uh, press function F5, and that solves your problem, I, uh, I discovered. So um, that's why you lost me. Uh, I was great. going to make well, some comments, now, closing so comments, great. really. Good. Uh, uh, closing comments, really, in the light of uh, my participation in this, in this Planet Art Reprints case. Um, and uh, and these are, uh, I've distilled them down to 10, uh, and I'm happy to take questions. But uh, the first one uh, was just following on from what Simon said then. Uh, really, this was a case where which we were running without evidence of actual confusion. We, we, we did look for it, but uh, uh, none became apparent. And actually, one we, we came up with a number of reasons why it, it wasn't apparent, uh, and these were put um, before the judge with also evidence supporting it. Uh, and not least, of course, this, this service is actually free, as, in, as it is implied in the name. Uh, and if you're basically getting a, a decent enough service from the competitor, uh, where theirs is free and yours is free, um, then uh, in many respects, not to complain. And the Brits, being the Brits, tend not to complain anyway. So it is actually quite hard to find evidence of actual confusion. Uh, and certainly where you have some, it will make your case easier. And the comment I make here is actually it, cost, it possibly makes your passing off claim, even stronger than your trademark claim, potentially. Um, and uh, that, uh, you know, here we had an outcome where we won on the trademark case, but not on the passing off, uh, and, and that was in the absence of it. Uh, so um, uh, do keep looking for it, but um, not having it doesn't uh, mean the end of the case. Balance of justice and, and convenience uh, really cropped up at the uh, stage, early stage in the case when we were applying for a preliminary injunction. Uh, the the, the, the um, defendant's brand, the product, started life. She called something else. It was originally called Printly by Photobox. And it launched with that and lasted a month. And then they actually overnight switched the name um, uh, from Printly by Photobox to Photobox Free Space Prints. And that's really what triggered uh, the action. And within about a week, we were in court trying to have a preliminary injunction on that, uh, which we did not succeed with. And I think part of the difficulty there was um, that our judge uh, simply really struggled to get her head round the idea that uh, anyone could possibly stop anyone using the words free prints in respect to product that provided prints for free. And that was a difficult one, but actually we've managed to pass the initial threshold test of whether there was an arguable case, and, uh, and we didn't succeed on the balance of justice and convenience in that particular scenario. Now, the third one is significant because it's part of the, uh, oh, sorry, it, it's surveys. Now, again, in the absence of evidence of actual confusion, um, uh, one of the uh, tools that one, one has to turn to is, is really survey evidence. And, um, and we had some preliminary uh, uh, trial surveys which indicated that there was uh, potential conf for confusion, but, the trial, uh, but, a, but a judge uh, on an application refused our application to allow in survey evidence. Interestingly, not just uh, in relation to proving uh, confusion or deception, but also for trying to prove uh, distinctiveness or even enhanced distinctiveness, goodwill, reputation. Uh, and that was somewhat more surprising. Uh, and it's quite clear that the UK judges are putting higher and higher hurdles in, in the way of bringing survey evidence in. Uh, and really, the, it, it will be quite difficult to justify, particularly bearing in mind the extra costs that are incurred, uh, submitting survey evidence. They are uh, obviously quite willing and very willing to, to draw their own conclusions on whether there's a likelihood of confusion uh, and deception. It's harder, though, to, to, for, I think, the judge to deny uh, survey evidence if that's 
perhaps your only way of proving uh, enhanced uh, or distinctiveness or, or acquired distinctiveness and reputation in our particular scenario because literally one sixth of the uh, UK population had downloaded this particular app uh, we weren't struggling in the end to, to prove the reputation side um, a particular virtue of the UK system is that you can secure trademark registration fairly quickly so this case started as a passing off case because there were no trademarks uh, registered trademarks in place when the uh, complaint when the acts uh, committed arose but um, within a few within probably 24 hours actually of, of this coming to us we suggested and we filed a, a registered trademark now with a two-month opposition period in the uk uh, the, the other party didn't oppose uh, we secured that registration uh, within about um, four or so months four and a bit months of, of the case starting so we then applied to amend the case and added in a trademark claim and as you'll have seen from simon's analysis we actually succeeded on the trademark claim and not on the passing off claim so it's always worth um uh, particularly if you you find yourself with a passing off case only to start with it is worth actually applying for a trademark at the same time and securing it before trial um again in these descriptive mark cases uh, because you're going to struggle, firstly, showing uh, the uh, validity of the right, and secondly, that it's actually had an operative effect on consumers, uh, it makes a real difference if you can at the same time show that there's some sort of uh, bad faith intent on the, behalf, uh, on the part of the defendant. Uh, and that did indeed help us, I think, in this case, had some cross-examination and disclosure materials that really didn't uh, paint the defendants in the best of lights, I think, to put it politely. Uh, and that led to some of the uh, interesting rulings by the judge, Daniel Alexander QC, uh, the, the one, for example, that uh, Simon alluded to about antisocial distancing. Uh, and uh, really, it was thanks to the process that we have in the UK that uh, revealed this, that I'm sure you wouldn't necessarily get the benefit of that in other jurisdictions. Um, uh, there are some downsides equally to the UK system, uh, which I'm flagging here. So the, the shorter trial scheme uh, is the scheme that we opted for on this one. Uh, which um, is supposed to bring things to a head at an earlier stage. Um, it's also supposed to have a single judge designated to trial right the way through from the case management uh, hearing onwards. Uh, uh, to be honest, that's honoured very much more in the breach than the observance. Uh, I think we had four different was it four different judges, I think, on this in this particular case, which is very much contrary to what the shorter trial scheme is supposed to be all about. Uh, each uh, time, obviously, you're spending a bit of time at the, at the beginning of each hearing to try and educate the judge about the facts uh, of that particular case. And talking of educating judges, uh, the other side of being in the shorter trial scheme is that you're in the normal chancery division. Uh, you're just in a quicker quicker part of it. And uh, it does mean you will not have this necessarily you have uh, specialist IP judges hearing your, your case. And this is particularly so for passing off and trademark cases because they're allocated to the, the general chancery. Uh, and um, that's fine, perhaps, if you have a trial that might last a week or more. Uh, but when you're in the shorter trial scheme, your, your trial is limited to four days. And that includes reading in time. So that effectively means uh, three days. And when you have some important points to get out uh, in cross-examination and uh, the, the disclosure process, you, you really want time for that. And if you then spend perhaps half a day or as much and sometimes even longer, I, I've had in some cases, where you're uh, uh, teaching in a non-specialist judge about um, trademark issues and passing off, then you're losing extremely precious time. Uh, and that can be a real concern. Uh, in, our, in our case, actually, um, we had the rare uh, honor of being uh, allowed to um, uh, reallocate judges because we raised this point and said, actually, we were originally allocated an, a non-specialist judge. And um, with that in mind, we, we managed to persuade the listings office that it would be ideal if we could have a specialist judge. And we did. And we ended up with Daniel Alexander. Um, and then my uh, well, eighth point splits into three. So that's how I get to 10. Um, it's not that my maths is bad. And you will see here that um, I'm actually now flipping it around and looking really from the defendant's point of view. Uh, and really, uh, and this is a scenario that many of you will be in, you know, you're asked, can we use uh, uh, this descriptive mark? Will we get away with it? Is it a problem? Are there all these prior rights? You know, people have seemingly amazingly managed to register. Are they a problem? And I think uh, inevitably, one of the answers is, well, just put it with your house mark and you're probably going to be all right. Um, I mean, it is 
you know, it's a bullet, but it's not a silver bullet. Uh, and as we saw in the fun time case, uh, where, uh, as Simon mentioned, actually our counsel in the free prince case, Daniel Alexander was the judge. He, he found that even though the trespass sign was being used in that fun time case, uh, that the use of fun time was more in a logo format and that was infringing. So just, but admittedly, the, the, the trespass name was somewhat separate from the fun time logo. So actually it wasn't used truly in combination. They just happened to be on the same page. If you use it truly in combination, as Photobox did with Photobox free prints, then you, you've got a much greater chance of getting off the hook as Photobox um, did with that particular use. Um, it was only problematic in terms of the logo, the, the app itself. Then uh, again, as a defendant, what do you do? Well, combine it with a logo, but combine it also maybe within a logo. And that actually can be uh, a, a better way out. Uh, and uh, as long as your logo doesn't look remotely like that of the claimants, then you, you probably stand a, a better chance. Uh, the misfortune I think that Photobox had is that they chose a logo that really was very like the um, Planet Art Freeprints logo. Uh, and that's how um, we managed to secure a win, at least on, on that element of their, their app. And the final point then is, is just use the mark as descriptively as possible. You, you, you know, the marketing team might be very keen to use it, but did they have to use it necessarily, for example, with a capital letter at the beginning of each word, like free and prints? Could you just use it as free prints as in lowercase or even free prints all uppercase? Uh, and those, that, that, that stands you in better stead to say, my use is my use is uh, honest and descriptive, uh, and, or isn't trademark use. Uh, and as Simon rightly picked up, there's you know, the, the point we're making there is, um, well, it's not use that affects the essential function of the trademark. It's just simply not trademark use. How can that be trademark infringement? Uh, and the same argument is run effectively for passing off. I'm not doing anything that's going to be deceptive. It, it, whatever goodwill you may have, I'm not doing anything that is actually deceptive and, and having an operative effect on the consumer's decision. Um, so that. Those are my observations on the case, um, and uh, I hope they, 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 they collectively, with what Simon has been saying as well, uh, give you a good picture of you know, where you can uh, use descriptive marks and whether and uh, when you might want to try and protect them. Um, now, we've got a few moments left for questions, not a lot of time, actually, uh, and we have a couple. Uh, there was uh, actually an interesting observation rather than a question I see from uh, one person who I know well, and I'll say hello to. Um, and that observation actually was that the benefit of registering these possibly descriptive marks, uh, obviously no admissions made, is that you can then actually use them for policing online, in particular social medias uh, and, and notice and takedown. And that is a, a, a wholly valid observation, of course, to make. And indeed, they can be useful. It's just actually sometimes you can have a real struggle securing them in the first place. And that can be um, slightly difficult. Um, but if you can, great. Uh, and then uh, uh, certainly in the social media notice and takedown world, it's rare that you then get a, a, a riposte that involves a, a cancellation challenge. Um, now, another question, I thought this one might be more for you, Simon, uh, was um, <laughs> secondary meaning. Uh, yeah, you said secondary meaning had to be proved for a passing off case if the mark is purely descriptive. But what if the mark is fanciful? I think that's a, uh, for you, Simon. Thank you. Um, yeah, so if, if the mark is, in a passing off case, if the mark is fanciful and not purely descriptive, um, so I think by fanciful here we mean um, not descriptive, there might be something a bit more unique about it. So uh, an example would be free prints being used as one word um, as opposed to the descriptive two words. Um, so if you have a fanciful mark, um, there's no need to shows in the passing off case. Um, that being said, you're still going to have to show goodwill, uh, misrep, and damage. And I think um, for a fanciful mark that might have descriptive elements, um, these are probably going to be harder to establish, even if you don't have to um, establish secondary meaning. Um, and Roland, correct me if I'm wrong, the, the, in the free prints case, our position was that the mark was um, not descriptive um, because it was used as the combined one word. Um, so our position was always that we didn't have to prove secondary meaning. Um, but obviously yes. there was still that obligation for us to prove reputation and goodwill. 
Yes. Uh, so we made a, a careful point, and uh, our, our council uh, throughout was referring to it as the fanciful term free prints. Uh, uh, and, um, <laughs> but it was it, it, one of the challenges. I felt very sorry for the court reporters who were doing the transcripts uh, because they were having to work out the difference between free prints and free prints. Uh, one word and two words, and so uh, there was a lot of time spent correcting that. Um, thank you. I've thank got you one for final one, Simon. Simon ask... oh, yes, go on. Um, just to, I think we've got time for one, one more, and I'm going to try one straight back to you. Um, and this question has been raised by some by someone. Um, do you think the fact Planet Art um, did not initially have a registration um, played into Photobox's decision to launch with their similar brand? Um, probably not. Uh, I, there was actually there were pending applications for uh, at, at the EU, um, but they were taking some time to go through. And um, certainly, what came out in the in the cross examination and disclosure was that uh, Photobox were wholly aware of reprints. Indeed, they were very much lining themselves up to try and um, compete directly with them. They um, so I don't think I think there was a deliberate choice to use the words separately. You know whether they uh, took advice on whether that was a good idea or not. I don't know, but it was. Um, I don't think if there had been a trademark registration in place for the the logo, the icon that we secured anyway, would have made any real difference. I suspect um, it did seem that they were intent on on doing that. Um, I, we have run out of time. There are some other questions. I, I will, we will come back to those other questions, if we may, um, to you directly. But thank you for asking them. Thank you for still listening, if you are still listening. Uh, and uh, we hope you found this of, uh, of use. It will be, um, the recorded version will be made available online shortly. Um, and uh, the next in our series is actually on Wednesday, the 8th of July. That will be on IP licensing and insolvency. Uh, until then, thank you very much. And we look forward to being back in contact with you.